This program is sponsored by The Church of God International and supported by our viewers. In times like these, we need the armor of God for the well-being of our families, to help you stand in the evil day. The Church of God International presents Armor of God, a program of biblical understanding. And now your host, Tony Bukert. Well, hello there, friends, and welcome to another Armor of God program. As I'm sitting here, I'm turned to one of my favorite scriptures back in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4. And just let me read it to you here for just a second. But you, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. You know, when I read scriptures like this regarding running to and fro, uh, it seems like the Bible's hit on something here regarding the fast pace of our lives. And I can't help but think about over the last several years, <laughs> just how fast paced my life has become uh, with a family and work and, and ministry. It just seems like I'm going from one deadline to the next deadline. I'm always running to and fro. And you consider some of these people who have these jobs, you know, they're, they're, they're jet setters and they travel every single day, maybe having breakfast in New York and maybe being back in time for dinner in California. It just seems like our lives have become so fast paced and so busy that sometimes we just fail to kind of slow down a little bit, kind of get off that wild merry-go-round, if you will, and as the cliche goes, just to kind of stop and smell the roses. When is the last time? And I, I ask myself questions like this all the time because I got to get centered, I got to get, got to get back to normalcy a lot of times with the hectic pace of everything. When was the last time you just took a walk? You just took a walk out in the woods, perhaps with, with your wife, with your husband, with a friend, or maybe just by yourself to just kind of contemplate the things of creation, the trees and the animals, how everything works together in this perfect symbiotic relationship that they have, and just to look at the goodness of the things that God has created for us to enjoy. You see, creation has more purpose to it than just functional. I mean, yes, everything works and gravity's here and we, we have the air to sustain life and water for the sustain of life and we have food for the sustenation and the sustaining of life. But, you know, God had another purpose in mind for creation. That's for us to enjoy it. Have you ever stopped to consider some of the things that are out there, you know, whether a beautiful sunset or a full moon or one of those great big beautiful harvest moons that oftentimes come out? Take a look at this scenery and we kind of get a glimpse and a picture of just how magnificent our God is in creating this androcentric earth to sustain us and to fulfill His purpose for mankind. But it just seems like we're just so busy today and we don't take time to just relax and enjoy it, even when we're relaxing. <laughs> we don't really relax, do we? I was noticing a couple the other day at the breakfast table, sitting there, sitting down to breakfast, and both of them had their phones on, just talking on their phones or texting people on their phones. And it seems like even when we're relaxing, why is it that we always, we always have to be connected to something or someone? We just can't sit there and talk and just enjoy the company of somebody else. We're just, we're just so geared on staying busy all the time, right? Well, ironically, with how busy we are, with all this information at our fingertips, do you realize mankind statistically and scientifically proven that we are actually getting smarter day by day. You know, my mom used to warn me, you better not watch too much TV. Uh, you better not watch too much. Back in the days, it was a VCR. We didn't have the DVDs and the things that they have nowadays. You better not watch too many movies on the VCR, too much cable, because if you do, you're going to dumb yourself down. Well, statistically speaking, that's not true. Mankind seems to be getting smarter and smarter by the day. There is an advantage to that, and there is also a disadvantage to becoming too smart, if you will, because there are some things that mankind has forgotten because we consider ourselves so smart and so wise. However, before I get into the next set of scriptures, what I'd like to do is I'd like to bring your attention to some items we'd like to make available to you, some offerings, if you will. Um, if you want to uh, call 888-578-578. Uh, 
888-578-8791. Again, that's 888-578-8791. We'd like to make available to you a CD titled Man's Inner Sense. Now, what is man's inner sense? Y'all, in, in regards to creation, there was something that God put in mankind, this inner sense, if you will, to want to believe in a higher being, to want to believe in a God, to look at creation and understand that there's somebody behind everything that we see, an original move or causer behind the sun and the moon and the stars and the things that, that we enjoy here. In addition to that, we also have a booklet, a very easy to read booklet, but yet very detailed. We'll answer a lot of your questions concerning uh, the topic today. It's entitled Evolution, Fact or Fallacy. And again, you can just simply call us on the phone number I've already given you, or you can go to the World Wide Web, cgi.org, and if you have any questions resulting from today's program or just questions in general, feel free to hit us up at info, I-N-F-O, that's info at cgi.org, and we'll answer your questions. Also, you might be aware that every Saturday, we have a webcast available to you. Now, the times for the webcast are gonna be listed on the website, so check out those times for the webcast and you can enjoy that as well. Now, right before the break, I was talking about the fast-paced lifestyle. I'm sure all you mothers and fathers and all you hard workers out there, and even some of us who retired seem, seem to think and understand that we don't have as much time as we thought we did even when we're retired, but we're talking about the, the fast-paced nature of life and how sometimes we forget to kind of settle down, slow down, and smell the roses and just enjoy the things that God created for us to be enjoyed. We also talked about how we're always connected to technology with these iPhones and what we call these, these little notebooks that they have, which really is a laptop but isn't a laptop, or, or a laptop computer. We're always looking up information, we're always finding things, and we're always busy, right? Well, there is a downside to that, and the fact of the matter is we have become so smart that sometimes we forget that there is a God out there, there is someone behind creation, because here is what people say in regards to God. God is a fictitious notion. This isn't me, this is what people say. I obviously believe in God. But God is a fictitious notion that is invented by the superstitious and people who are, well, uneducated and unlearned. We're too smart to believe in a God because we can see proof that there's other reasons for creation out there. You know, a more natural reason, not a supernatural one, for creation. Here's what we've forgotten. Over here in the book of Genesis, chapter one, let's go right to the beginning, because that's what Genesis means, it means beginnings. Right off in the book of Genesis, the scriptures jump out at us and reveal something to us. It's something that mankind is deviated from a little bit here. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Not, not natural selection, not, not a big bang theory, Nothing like that, not, nothing that happened by chance and chaos and happenstance as a result of some great big gigantic atom that exploded. But God, Elohim, a plural word, plural word. God created the heavens and the earth. The, form, the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And it was God that said, let there be light. Verse two here. And God saw the light that was good, and God divided the light and the darkness. It's just not real popular nowadays, seems like, to believe in a God of creator. God of creator is not taught in our schools anymore. You know, when I was in high school, and I'm going back, what, 25 years now, was the last time that I darkened the door of a high school. 25 years ago, when I was in high school, our teachers, at least back then, allowed a debate to happen in the classroom. They were teaching us evolution, but at the same time, they were also recognizing that there were some of us out there who believed that there was someone else, a su supernatural supreme being that intelligently designed everything that we see. It looks like to me that there is intelligence behind the design and the form and the function of creation. You know, relatively speaking, when you talk about evolution. And I really love the way that the British pronounce this word evolution. You know, they call it evolution. And this is why I like to call it evolution. Because by definition, evolution is nothing more than a way to explain creation apart from God. That's right. 
people who don't want to believe that there's a God explain things through natural means, not, not supernatural means. However, as we progress through today's program, and as this unfolds, I want to show you exactly why that is so grievous to God, why He doesn't like it. Because God actually created within man, in the Garden of Eden, as a result of creation, this, what theologians call this inner sense. You know, we oftentimes think of our senses uh, in the senses that we are taught in school. Sight, sound, touch, taste, and hearing, right? Well, there was also uh, an additional component to those, something called the inner sense. And this is why I think it's so grievous not to consider uh, a God at all, let alone a God of creation, because through the scriptures we see that the concept of a God was actually created within mankind. And we can prove this not only through the scriptures, but we also have some external influences that we can look to or sources to prove that there was something created within us that makes us want to believe in us. So not to believe in a God is 100% counterintuitive to what was placed within inside man in the days of creation, all the way back then. That's why it's so grievous to God to not consider this. But relatively speaking, as I was saying, you know, evolution is more of a modern concept. Right sometime in the 400s, but in the mid to late 400s BC, you had two individuals come on the scene, and even going up into the 500s BC, two individuals came up and proposed a more natural means or cause for creation. I'm talking about Plato and Aristotle. You see, oftentimes what we do is we assign evolution or the origin or the theory of evolution to Charles Darwin. Now, he might have went a little bit more detailed in creating uh, a lot of the theory behind evolution, but really it goes back to 400s BC and the early 500s BC with Plato and Aristotle, the philosophers. They were the first ones, at least recorded anyways, who really believed or wanted to learn creation apart from a creator. Okay, so it's relatively new. Before that time, before that time, the 400s, do you realize that virtually every culture, not talking about subcultures that might reside in a culture, but every culture in the world believed in a supernatural being of some kind. I'm not saying that they always had uh, you know, their ducks in a row here and they had the real creator, the real God in mind. You know, oftentimes they, they deviated and, and worshiped nature rather than you know, Elohim here as we, we read in the scriptures. But this is how I can say, looking at history, how it is absolutely counterintuitive to mankind to not believe in a higher being. And I want to issue a challenge. You know, kind of a fun thing to do here. Take some time as we're connected with our fingertips, with a, the computer or our iPhones or our notebooks or whatever else they'll come up with here, and just do a little bit of a research. And I want to challenge you to find one example in history Anywhere, any time period. Go back as early as history will take us. And I want to challenge you and find one primitive tribe of people, one continent of people, even the remote parts, remotest parts of the forest, whether South America, you want to look at Africa, you want to go to the Aborigines in Australia. Take a look at history. And I challenge you to find one example, just one, of a nation of people a body of people, a race of people who didn't start their earliest foundations without some form or a concept of a higher being. You won't find it because every culture down through time, down through history, has always had this concept, at least in the back of their minds, that there was somebody, someone, an original mover, an original causer behind everything that we see because they could see him through the design of everything. You know, God reveals himself through his creation. We can learn a lot about God's nature just by simply looking at creation. We learn a lot about him. But as this argument has unfolded, we see two schools of thought nowadays, moving it back up to more modern times here, two schools of thought, the Christians, okay? And not just Christians, but there are other uh, pagan forms of religion and, and different forms of religion in general that believe in a higher being uh, that created everything that we see. But we believe that the first man, Adam, was created in the Garden of Eden 
and everything that was set in place, the earth and the sun and the moon, was androcentric in the sense it was to facilitate God's creation, right? Well, we have a little bit of a conflict between, the, I call it the battle of the two atoms. The battle of the A-D-A-M, the man that was made out of red clay and Jesus bent down in the, in the ground and breathed the breath of life into his, to his nostrils and stood him up and said, you are ish, you are man, and went on to explain everything that he had to explain to Adam and had a relationship with God in the Garden of Eden. And the controversy and the battle between the atom, A-T-O-M, where evolutionists believe that there was this great big hydrogen atom. And it began to expand and expand and expand more until it couldn't expand anymore. And all of a sudden it just exploded. And as this exploded, everything that we see was set in motion. Everything was created by natural causes. So we have this controversy here. Well, who's right? Who's right in this debate? Well, I believe, and the presenters of the armor of God believe, that God, Elohim, is the original creator. And you might be surprised to find out just who it was that did the creation. You know, he comes down to us in history as Jesus Christ. He reveals himself in the New Testament as Jesus Christ, but in the beginning he was known as the Word or the Logos, the spokesman, the agent from whom the Father did the creating. What about you? What do you believe? Do you believe God exists? Is there a higher being responsible for the sun and the moon and the stars that we see? Did God leave any proof or evidence for our consideration for his existence? Or is it completely reliant upon what most people erroneously assume is the Christian's blind faith? Yes, the Bible tells us that we should live by faith and not by sight. However, if God didn't want us to look to any kind of evidence to support his existence, I would submit to you and ask you this question, then why did he leave us so much evidence to consider? I'm always taken back to the story of, of Thomas. You know, some people may think that what I'm saying today, uh, looking at evidence for God's nature and as the, the, the creator of creation, looking at evidence is, is counter faith. It really isn't. You know, God understands our temporal nature and our need to have our senses satisfied, right? Remember the story of Doubting Thomas, the post-resurrection scene, when all the disciples came and say, look, we've seen Jesus, he's resurrected. What did Thomas say? I'm not going to believe unless I see him, I'm paraphrasing now, and I put my fingers into his hands, you know, where the nails pierced through his skin and into the wood, and unless I can put my finger into his side, I'm not going to believe. That's why he comes down through history known to us as Doubting Thomas. Well, I've always found the response of Christ very interesting. Did he in any way rebuke Thomas? Well, we know that he rebuked the disciples because he, they didn't believe the accounts of the other disciples. But what did he do with Thomas? He simply said, Thomas, look upon my hands. Here's the holes. Here's my side. View me, look at me, examine me, and try me. Here's your evidence. I'm real, I'm alive, and I exist. That, ironically, friends, is something that we actually have in common with people of the atheistic mindset, people who are skeptics. And I hate to use the word skeptics. I think we're all naturally skeptic to some degree. I want to use the word scoffers because a scoffer wouldn't believe in Jesus Christ. If we were to knock on the front door, hand them the morning newspaper, and sit down and have a cup of coffee with them, they still wouldn't believe because they have an agenda not to believe, oftentimes. But Jesus does and God does afford us proof to look at him, to examine him, to try him. It comes down to us in Christianity, a theological term called apologetics. And apologetics is nothing more than using evidence to support our viewpoints. Now, back here in the book of Genesis chapter 1, I'll go back there for just a, a brief moment. In Genesis chapter 1, there's some things about God that we can learn from His creation. In Genesis chapter 1, I'm not going to go over uh, the whole chapter of Genesis chapter 1 because it would be a lengthy read for today. But I'm going to kind of segment this uh, for, the, for the sake of the program and just begin reading here in verse 20 of Genesis 1. Then God said, 
Let the waters abound with the abundance of living creatures, and let the birds fly above the, the firmament of the heavens. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves, which in the waters abounded according to their kind, and every winged bird according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. You know, we want to talk about Christianity being faith-based. I have faith or confidence that what the book of Genesis records for us, for mankind, to understand about God and, and the beginnings of things, I have faith that this account is true. I don't question it. I believe it's true. However, to point to Christianity as simply faith-based, and that's kind of a, a, a backhanded comment, if you will, about Christianity, I've always found it interesting that evolution itself, or the belief in evolution, do you realize that evolution requires more faith to believe than it does in a, in a supreme creator who, who's behind all this? Because I can point to you some evidence of Christ in the scriptures, and I'm going to get to that here in just a second. Uh, as we read down through this, you'll see that God does leave us some evidence here about who and what he is and why we could, should consider him as the author of everything that we see in creation. Okay, we'll just pick it back up here um, in Genesis chapter 1. In 22, and God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. So the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature, according to its kind, cattle, creeping thing, and beast of the earth, each according to its kind. And that is key to understanding God is the creator of everything that we see. Everything procreates after its kind, and in our understanding that every creature procreates after its kind, we can understand something about the nature of God because even the nature of God in the realm of Christianity has been hijacked to be turned into something that's not. Most of the world believes in a trinity, but we'll see exactly what the Bible says here about the nature of God. In verse 25, And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle of over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And here we have mankind looking at us today. We have absolutely fulfilled this command by God to procreate to fill the earth and to subdue it, and mankind resides just as God wanted him to as the apex of his creation. There is no higher created life form than man. And how can I say that? Because as you go down through that account here, we read that cattle produced, uh, procreated after its kind, uh, fish and the birds of the air, they pre procreate after their kind. So when we get down to this account of man and what God was doing, that God is using mankind's procreation to create for himself a family, an exponential family, based on God-like creatures, man. And there's something different about man in creation. When you look at man and you compare him to an animal, you know, evolutionists will always say that, well, man has the same genetic makeup basically as a monkey, roughly 98 to 99%, but yet we see something much different from man than a monkey, and that one or two percent difference is very different. When was the last time you saw a monkey, an ape, or some sort of uh, upright creature like that sit down and enjoy a nice meal? You know, there's something different about him, a, a, a component to man that's different than animals. To sit down and cut up his steak, to sip on a glass of wine. You ever give a steak dinner to a monkey and see what he does with it? He just sits there and he'll eat it, he'll, he'll golf it down, he'll, he'll sip, he won't even sip down the, the, the wine, he'll just kind of chug it back here. But you know there's something else unique about mankind. You ever seen a monkey or an ape sit down and worship and offer praise and thanks 
to a God that created them before they eat. I've never seen anyone in the animal world do that. There's something in us that's different. There's something about us that's different, our mind, our spirit. And quickly here, in the book of Romans, chapter 1, Romans chapter 1, this is why this is so grievous to God when we don't consider him anymore as our creator because it is absolutely inexcusable to overlook him because we willfully have gotten rid of him. In verse 18 of Romans 1, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth. God is suppressed in the schools. He's, he's suppressed in our government. And unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things which are made, even His eternal God, Godhead and power. So they are without excuse. Well, friends, once again, I would like to make available to you the items of our offerings today simply by calling 888-578-8791. Again, that's 888-578-8791. Order the CD, Man's Inner Sense. And while you're there, get the booklet, Evolution, Fact or Fiction. And if you'd rather hit us up on the web, see us at CGI.org. And if you have any questions as a result of today's program, info at CGI.org. It's take a more detailed look through the CD and the booklet about what God is doing, the proofs of creation over evolution and atheism, this inner sense that God has created within us because God in creation with man made us much different. And along with our five senses, he created within us a desire, an ability to worship, and a want to worship. That's why I say it's so grievous for mankind not to believe or to total dis disregard him as our creator because only a fool would deny what he knows to be true. And God made sure that we knew that by creating our inner sense. Well, friends, until next time, you keep on that armor and I'll keep my armor on as well so we all can stand in the evil day and we'll see you here next time. Armor of God and the free material offered is brought to you by The Church of God International of Tyler, Texas. You may write to us at 3900 Thames Street, Tyler, Texas, 75701, or call toll-free at 1-888-578-8791, or call one 939 during regular business hours. You may visit our website at www.cgi.org, or email us at armorofgodcgi.org. We appreciate your prayers and support. This program is sponsored by The Church of God International and supported by our viewers.